Thank you for the good music. Appreciate our musicians. And I certainly appreciate your wonderful voices singing the Lord's praises this morning. It's good to be here with you this morning. My privilege to do so. I'd like to have us have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for hearing us out of our hearts, sentiments of our hearts, just giving thanks and praise. So thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your grace in sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you, Father, for loving us as you do, as you always have, that your love is an everlasting love. Thank you, Lord, for that. So bind our hearts continually together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most comforting things I know is that God loves us and God cares for us. I want you to turn your Bibles way back to the end of the Scriptures. Way back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Our lesson is going to be in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter this morning. And I have maybe cherry-picked a verse and then we will work our way up to it. But the verse is one that you've quoted, I've quoted many times. And uh, that verse is in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 7, 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. And there it says, Casting all your care upon him, he careth for you. That's a wonderful, comforting thought that he cares for us in every moment of life. Many times, doing funeral services for folks, of course, I've been able to tell them that God cares for them, that God loves them in spite of it all. One time, I was in a home of a fellow, and I was expressing to him God's love for him, and I'll never forget his coming back at me with a very uh, challenging, how do I know God loves me, was the snarl that came from his lips and from his mouth. And I said, well, I'm glad you asked that, because I'm glad to tell you exactly how God loves you. And of course, they took him to John 3.16, which points out for us the greater love that God has had, that He gave His only Son. He gave up the best that He had, that He might save us from the worst of life, and that He is able to save to the uttermost all who come to God by Him, seeing He ever liveth, to make intercession for them. And so it's wonderfully comforting to me. I remember the one story, and sometimes adolescents go through these things, and maybe some of you have gone through these things, where the unusual... Uh, maybe the last thing that happens that you don't want to happen. Like I remember this little cartoon showed this uh, adolescent girl, this teenage girl, and she, and it was the old days when we had the lockers in the schools, you know, and she had the padlock in her hand with the locker. And she was saying, God doesn't love me or my locker would open, you know. <laughs> We've all had that thing where there's a flat tire or maybe the appliance, oh, there's water all over the floor or, uh, you know, whatever is next. And we think, oh, why didn't God allow this to happen? No. I've had that in my own life from time to time. There it is. Sudden, unexpected sorrow. But I know God loves me, loves you. I know God cares. So we can cast our care upon Him. What that may, mean, simply means is that we place our trust in Him. Uh, like fishing, you know, cast it out there, you know. Or maybe playing frisbee, or maybe playing ball. You, you cast it out there. And know that he, he'll, he'll take our sorrow, He'll take our discouragement, He'll take our fears. I just looked at the paper slightly this morning, didn't read the whole thing, just on the front of the parade thing, I just noticed this article, I'll read it later, uh, where the young lady was saying, I, I, I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of everything. Or maybe she said, I was afraid of everything. That is tough to be afraid of everything. Folks, as Christians, we don't have to go through life walking on eggshells or waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, we don't have to live that way. But God's Word tells us over and over again to trust Him, to rest in Him, to place our faith in Him. Casting all your care, your anxiety, your burden upon the Lord. He'll take care of you. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. Now, he'll take us through 
the difficulty, whatever that difficulty might mean. And so, whether a time of discouragement or maybe even depression or it's something that causes you to be despondent, no matter what it is. And I was remembering a dear friend of mine who is now with the Lord. He's been there for a number of years. But he was a missionary. He'd been a missionary in Brazil. He and his family for some time. And then because of his wife's health, they had to come back to the States. And he was pastoring a very uh, wonderful uh, branch church that had been started by the same group that started the church that I started. And so he was at branch number one. That was at branch number two. So we were colleagues. We were friends. And I'll never forget one day he'd been having a difficult time with something. I don't know what it was. And uh, he came up with this thing. He just says, I don't think that sometimes that anybody cares about what happens to me. Sometimes I just feel like nobody gives a snap of their fingers whether I live or die. Now that was an extreme expression. And of course, I'm sure his wife would say, whoops, not true. <laughs> not true. And it is not true. Because all in all, if you think nobody cares, I want you to know that God cares. He cares for you. He cares for me with His infinite heart of love. There was a um, pastor, preacher. Anyway, he was to speak at a certain church many, many miles away. I think this might have been in horse and buggy days or maybe in the old days when the cars just did a little, little putt but about 30 miles an hour. But he had some distance to go to preach in his church. It was early in the morning. His wife was just deathly sick. Didn't want to leave her. He knew he had to go. They were depending on him. And what was interesting was his youngest son said to his dad, Dad, honestly, don't worry about Mom. God will take care of her. And you know what? We'll do our share too, <laughs> said the young boy. Encouragement from his dad, son. And so away, away he went and was gone for the day and uh, had to preach in the morning, preach in the afternoon, back in his putt-putt or his horse and buggy, I don't know which it was, slow transportation. And away he came back home, getting home late at night. He found that God had helped his wife. In fact, she had, had felt well enough in the afternoon that afternoon that she sat down at the piano and she was able with the piano, she began to write these words to the songwriter. The words she wrote were these, Be not dismayed, whate'er betide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. And then the chorus goes, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. Maybe you remember that old hymn. It's been in all the old hymn books for a number of years. That God had touched her and raised her up. And all of us have had that thing where sometimes an illness or a sickness is temporary. Sometimes it lasts. We've all been through this incredible pandemic where people are asking each other, have you gotten your taste buds back? Have you gotten your taste back? Have you your smell back? Or all this and that and the other. I think with the allergies that I have, and there are a lot of perfumes that just about sent me into orbit, maybe I should lose my smell a while. <laughs> You know, I, I had the experience sometimes of just almost going in orbit with sneezing. Oh, my word, i got to get out of here. That lilac smell or whatever it is drives me crazy, you know. And so we all have these things. And God will bring us through. God will bring it through. He will do that. He always has. There was a fam famous English preacher who was um, as a young boy was visiting an older lady, dropped in on her. I've had that experience too. When you're young, he dropped in on this older lady. This was in Scotland, I think. And uh, he began to tell her some things he'd been doing. And she listened to him. And uh, then she said to him, after he explained these things that he had expressed to her, she said, look, lad, you look up at that plaque. There's a plaque on the wall that said, Thou God seest me. Now that... Phrase comes from the Old Testament, from Genesis. It's, I think it was Hagar, maybe, who had the experience of thinking she was going to die. She and Ishmael. And uh, the angel of God helped her out. And she said, and so out of that came that phrase, Thou, God, seest me. And so the older lady said, Laddie, she said, folks say that God's eyes upon you to mark out and watch your sins and watch your shortcomings. But she said, you know something? God's eyes is upon you because He loves you 
and He cares for everything that happens to you. And that is so true as God watches over us. It does make a difference whether we know the Lord or not, of course. And uh, what an encouraging thing it is to know as a Christian that God marks our steps and knows our way. Job, he knoweth the way that I take. But when he hath tested me or tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That's in, that's in Job. This morning as I was combing my hair, and I thank God at 88 years of age I still have some hair, you know, to comb. You know, and so as, as I was combing my hair this morning, uh, I, I, I noticed some of it was down in the sink, a little bit of it. I thought, boy, this not too much at a time, I hope. And then I thought of what Jesus said when he said, The very hairs of your head are numbered. And I have a few friends who would say, Zero. <laughs> you know. Someone said the nicest thing that a 65 or 70 year old man can say to the barber is just take a little off the top. That's a great thing, you know. Not everybody can say that, you know. Hairs of your head are numbered. God knows. He knows our weaknesses. Here's another one. Psalm 56, verse 8 says, Put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? So Psalm 56, 8 says that God bottles our tears. What does that mean? It means He knows our sorrow. He knows all about it. Many years ago, there were some missionaries in Ecuador, and tragically, the, the fellow was working on his vehicle, and it came off the jack and down and crushed him. And he was killed. Oswald J. Smith was in a pastor up in Toronto, Canada. This was his brother-in-law. And he got news of this. And when he heard about it, he sat down to, to pen his sister a note to send her immediately. And the words came to him, Nobody knows your sorrow. Nobody knows your care. But Jesus is the one who really knows. I didn't have the words exactly right, but the idea that nobody knows but Jesus, our heartache, our sorrow. He knows all about what we face. He knows it all. And back in Malachi, the third chapter, I read this in verse 16, about the remnant of Israel and the difficulties they were having of being persecuted, undergoing terrible times. And here's what God's Word says. A book of remembrance was written before Him, for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon His name. Even persecuted saints, and there are many Christians undergoing terrible times in many parts of the world, you know. I can remember one set of missionaries, I think it was in Panama, I think, and uh, the guerrillas there were terrible toward them. And the thought that these missionaries had is, does anybody know where we are? Does anybody know where we are? And this woman's husband spoke up and said, Honey, if no one else does, God knows where we are. Now they took his life. How horrible. But she later came back to the States and for a number of years was speaking and testifying and speaking of God's grace and goodness in the midst of difficulties. As a young Sunday school boy, I can remember my Sunday school teacher, and just, I've never forgotten this, it was during War Two days, and I was just a little boy, and I remember his telling how they were going into Willow Run, which is near Detroit. They used to make a lot of bombers, a lot of airplane uh, activity for the war were being made there, and he was in that area, and he was coming down the steep hill. It was a divided lane, limited access type of a highway. And as he was coming over the brow of the hill, something said, slow down, slow down, slow down, and he slowed down just in front of him. Ran the light, right, or ran the stop sign right in front of him. He said, my, if I'd kept going, it would have been a horrible, horrible collision. Uh, so, so sometimes God does warn us in those quiet things of what to do. He does. And when I've had it happen where God has just seemed to have told me, uh, you need to watch it, you need to watch it. And uh, Psalm 37, 23, here's a verse, a terrific verse. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he directs his way. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And so God does know the way that I take. He meets us in exactly that way. 
In First Peter, coming back there, I'm going to run the verses, but uh, in the first place, I just want to understand the background that Peter, the old fisherman, uh, wrote was one of suffering in the background. He wrote to suffering believers. He wrote in the first century. He wrote especially to Jewish Christians, but he called them in 1 Peter chapter 1, strangers scattered throughout all, and he mentioned the places where they were scattered. And so how would you like it, and how would I like it to be scattered? To be driven different places by maybe a persecution, and to be told you must go here, you must go there. This happened to the Jewish, Jewish nation many times. As the captivity took place, had taken place in the old days, and suddenly to be uprooted, leaving everything behind, the things that you enjoy, the things that you think are dear. Of course, sometimes people have a, have a fire and they lose everything in a fire. Huh? Or maybe a storm, something happens of that nature and they lose it all. You know, what a thought in those times that God is near to us. He is near to us. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, the thing that I gleaned from this section from Peter is he begins to write to these persecuted Christians about suffering. That's what it's all about, suffering. He explains to them, in spite of all that we may go through, there's one thing we need to remember. And there's one thing we need to hang on to. That no matter what anything happens, no matter what anyone does to us, there's one thing that people can't take away from us and that is our relationship to Jesus Christ. See? No matter what suffering we go through, and Peter said, though, uh, it, it now for you, it, it, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold trials and temptations. Even though that happens, you're in the midst of the storm, he says. There's one thing that's precious, and that is our faith in Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 7 that the testing, the trying of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. And so, folks, when we go through difficult times, it's times of loss, times of heartache, <laughs> times of maybe illness, times of the storm, it's our faith that really carries us through. See? And remembering, this doesn't happen to you because God's angry with you. In such a time, cast your care upon Him. Why? He cares for you. He cares for you. And we don't always know what's happening or why it's happening. I was watching a couple of these dads with their little ones up in their arms, you know, here a little while ago. And uh, I thought some of these kids are getting so tall. My goodness, can't it's almost outgrowing you there in the arms, you know. They, they tend to do that, you know. They, and yet we hold them in our arms. My youngest son was three years of age. Uh, we were in Portage, Michigan many years ago. My older son, three years of age. And he began to ha ask me to hold him all the time. He asked me to pick him up in his arms and to hold him. And we'd be going through a place or maybe through a mall, a mall or a parking lot or wherever we went, he always wanted me to hold him. And I thought that that was kind of strange. He was getting big now. Three years of age almost. And he was getting big. And I thought, you'll be as big as I am. I'll be carrying this kid as big as I am. The arms get tired, you know. So we moved to Detroit. And I became a staff member in a large church there. And when we got there, my wife said, I better go into a doctor and get him started a pediatrician. So she found him a doctor. She went into the doctor, took him there. And there was a reason he was asking his dad to hold him. He had a heart murmur. He had a narrowing of his aorta. The blood was not getting down into his legs as they should have. He was having terrible leg aches. And I can well remember my brother-in-law and his ignorance saying, you dummy, carrying that kid around, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're spoiling that kid, Rod. Right? I remember at the time thinking, I don't know about that. I didn't answer him back. I just was quiet. But I don't understand this. It's something I don't know right now. But we don't all, always know everything right now. But we do know up ahead. And so we had surgery and wonderfully took care of it. You know, So there's a reason sometimes for our pain and the difficulties that we go through. We don't always know why. I was thinking of the 
the psalmist, I wrote this down, who must have been going through terrible difficulties. This is, by the way, if you want to write it down, it's Psalm 77, verse 9. Psalm 77, verse 9. Boy, he must have been going through a terrible time. Here's what he said. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his mercies? That was a question. Has God forgotten about me? Have you ever felt God forsaken? Felt so lonely to just die? You know, you just felt so out there, you know. Here's an Old Testament verse to encourage. This is great. This is Isaiah chapter 49, 15 and 16. Listen to this verse. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Can a woman forget her baby? Can a woman forget her child? Have you any of you ever forgotten your kids? Oh boy. <laughs> we were in choir practice in the way I was a pastor there for several years, and we were having choir practice. It was like 4.30 in the afternoon. And the Owen family, I'll never forget, they came in. The three older ones, Bonnie, had dropped off. We had to have nursery for them so we practice choir, obviously, for the kids and stuff. So, Anyway, Steve came in, sat down. We were singing in between the Christmas practice. She said, Steve, did you get Brett in the nursery? You would have thought she slapped him in the face. Out he ran, jumped over the court. Down he ran, sprinted out of the church. Away he goes. She said, well, he forgot Brett, didn't he? <laughs> Yeah, he did. Had to drive about five miles back for Brett, bring him back to church about 20 minutes later. Here he walks up, not a word, it's a stunning choir. Everything is well, you know. That's never happened to you. One time we were in Yuba City, California. We drove out of a gas station we had been, and I didn't know that my three-year-old had slipped out of the back of the station wagon and gone in the, in the store. I didn't know. We drove down the road once to Kmart. And uh, we were in there, we came out, and I thought I'd look in the back. No, no, where is he? Panic. We went back in the Kmart, my wife and Gordy, my older boy, and he looked and looked. And he's not in the Kmart, thought we came. Uh, where is he? Jumped in the car, backtracked. Sure enough, he's sitting outside the gas station with a bottle of pop the attendant had given to him. <laughs> it was great. And I remember saying to him later, in later years, like maybe just in the last year or two, talking about the incident, I said, did you think we had actually left it? Nah, he said, I knew you were coming back. <laughs> it happens, it happens. But here is the wonderful thought. Can one forget the son of her womb? Listen to this answer. Yes, they may forget. Yep. I may forget. Yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. No wonder it says God cares for us, remembers us, knows us. He has us on, on his mind and heart. He loves us. He knows all about it. In time of doubt like that, know that he cares for you and for me. I think of Daniel's experience uh, back in writing the book of Daniel, the persecution of King Nebuchadnezzar, the great image, they were to bow down. The three young Jewish men will not bow down. They're all called on the carpet before Nebuchadnezzar. And you remember the story. He threw them back in, the, in that oven, you know, that furnace. And there was a fourth one who was in there with him. Who was in there? Yeah, the Lord was with him in that thing. Not a hair of their head singed because the Lord was with them. And so, wonderful is the deliverance of the Lord in such times that He will deliver us no matter what the trial is that we face. Uh, and we remember the name of Lot over in Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says that the Lord is able to deliver the righteous from anything. And He referred to Lot, who was in Sodom. And the Lord did deliver Lot and brought him up safely. God wonderfully cares for us. There's a little chorus that says, God answers prayer in the morning, God answers prayer at noon, God answers prayer in the evening, so keep your heart in tune. He will help you. 
In the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, there's about three commands, and I'll leave you with this. And that is, first of all, he talks to shepherds about shepherding the flock in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4. How a shepherd should not do so for uh, wrong motives, for wrong reasons, uh, but rather he's to do it with the right kind of an attitude. He's not to be a dictator. He's to be a shepherd. A shepherd cares for his sheep. Read Psalm 23 sometime. How wonderfully he does that. Beginning in verse 5, then, he refers to the sheep. He refers to the flock of God. And there are three wonderful commands here that he gives them in any difficulty. And the first one is to be clothed with humility. To humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Did you know that God hates pride? That God hates arrogance? That he hates it? Six things the Lord hates. A proud look. An arrogant manner. Wow. It is better for us to humble ourselves than for God to humble us. Don't you think so? Yeah, I, I think so. Better for us to do it. To humble ourselves. To seek the lowly path that God would have. And Jesus did that. In Philippians chapter 2, where it describes how the Lord took upon himself, it says, the form of a servant. Anybody been signing up lately to be a servant? Anybody signing up for that job here? Places no room of people signing up to be a servant. But we're to humble ourselves because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. It's worthwhile seeking to be a person who is humble in the eyes of the Lord. The second thing, then, is this part that we mentioned to you in verse 7 of chapter 5, that casting all your care upon Him, He careth for you. Which means to avoid anxiety and to trust the Lord and just let Him take care of it. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Trust in the Lord. Do good. And so shalt thou dwell in the land. All those verses that speak of trust, trust, trust. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And so on. We need to do that in such a day as this. Be humble. Be humble. Verse 8 says that we're to be alert. We're to be alert. We're to watch out for the devil. We're to watch out for his ways. We're to watch out for evil ways. 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee also youthful lusts, but follow godliness and traits of that nature. Now, when I was a boy, when I was young, the temptations that we had were, well, they had, they had a list of things that we shouldn't do. Quite a long list of stuff you shouldn't do in my church. You probably heard about that little girl, and somebody said to her, little girl, what's your name? And she said, she said, Mary. And she said, what's your last name? Oh, my name is Mary. Don't. Why is that? Well, she'd heard her mother say Mary Don't so many times. She thought that was her last name. So, you know, just Mary Don't because of all the don'ts, 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 don'ts. But the tragic thing of today are the temptations that are so near to us. I've seen it in my grandchildren with that thing in their hand. The temptation that that thing is. How we've got to resist that temptation. So brainwashing. So divisive. It's terrible. As well as the computer and the television, which we've been know as well. You've got to. You've just got to take those things and not let them carry you away and not be watching stuff you ought not to do. We need to be sober. Be in business with our Christian life. Be vigilant because the. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Resist. Resist. Avoid him. That's what we do. We cast our care upon God, but we have to deal with the devil and his ways as well. The last thought is in the 10th verse. It says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, Kind of, this is where we started out, didn't we? After that you have suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. And so, suffering is a very real part. We need to be alert. We need also to uh, 
after we've suffered, to trust that the Lord will provide and take care of us. Now, hindsight's always better than foresight, as we know well. That is true. But to know that God goes before us. We don't know always where that road will lead out. But to know that God will take care of you. And every day or all the way, He will take care of you. He will take care of Grace Community Church. Take care of your family. He will take care of you as an individual. He will do that. And I thank God we can just commend ourselves to Him. One thing that I do wonder is if you really are saved and you've trusted Christ as your Savior. Because if you've not done that, that's where you have to start. And God does care for you. And God does love you. And God did send His Son for you. But your part is to trust Jesus as your Savior. Father, we thank You this morning for the power of Your Word. We thank You that You're there, Lord. You know, all, you know our ways, Father. Thank You that You know all about us. And therefore, Lord, would we commit our way unto You for You to guide us and for You to keep us. So, Father, we have a very grateful heart this morning as we've come. And, Lord, we love You because You so much loved us and cared for us. So thank you, Lord, so much. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord. Amen.